keep off stars and 101 enology. If you have some question any time between now and the final examination that you think I can answer, I'll be glad to, to talk to you. Uh, as I'm sure your section leader will also, or Dr. Singleton. We are going to have a very quick and rapid uh, tour of the wine world starting today and uh, ending up uh, with how to taste wines on the last lecture in early June. Now, uh, I lecture fairly rapidly, so if you don't have a lecture outline, you will be well advised to get one. There will always be one at that door. There will always be one at this door. And I have a few extra copies down here. So if you don't have one, if you missed it as you came by, pick it up now. And on future lectures, pick it up as you come in, either at this door or that door or some copies down here. It's always interesting to know where the subject that you are studying started. But it didn't start with wine, unfortunately. The first um, alcoholic beverages that we have any record of, at any rate, were in the Paleolithic period. And they seem to have been the fermentation product of honey or mead. It must have been a pretty bad product because mead does, uh, honey does not ferment very well into mead. In fact, it ferments very slowly. Uh, I'm sure that somebody's going to try it, and uh, they'll be disappointed in the results. Even commercial mead is not very good. It doesn't have that balance of sugar and acid that grapes have to make a balanced product. It will taste very flat to you not be acid. It will spoil very easily. And it won't ferment dry, because it has a very low nitrogen content. <clears throat> In fact, if you're going to make mead, the, the ordinary practice, or the home winemaker practice, is to chop up some raisins in the uh, honey, the diluted honey. You dilute the honey about three to one, and chop up a few raisins and uh, hope that there will be enough nitrogen in the raisins to supply the yeast with the nitrogen they need to go on. At any rate, so far as we know, mead was the first alcoholic beverage produced. It seems to be related to an Indian alcoholic beverage, which was called Soma, and which dates from about 3000 BC, near as we can tell. The first large-scale production of an alcoholic beverage, however, was beer. The reason for this is that the first domestication of plants was barley, not grapes. Someplace in the Fertile Crescent, Tigris, Euphrates, Iraq, Iran area, uh, in a period as early as 8,000, 9,000 BC, somebody learned how to plant the seeds of a cereal barley or wheat or emmer, a wheat-like plant, harvest the seed therefrom, crush the seed, and allow it to ferment. Now, it fermented because yeast are every place. They're a unicellular plant organism, floats around in the air. If I expose some Petri dishes here, uh, once in a while I would get a yeast cell. And so, at some t stage in this period of time, a yeast cell got into some crushed grain. And it started to grow rather slowly, but it did grow, and uh, made an alcoholic beverage. It was sort of like alcoholic mush, if you can imagine that. Uh, the oatmeal that you had for breakfast this morning with about 3 or 4% alcohol added to it would be about what they ate or drank. It had the effect, but it certainly didn't have very much aesthetic appeal. And this early sort of gruel-like beverage uh, was uh, about all that we had until we discovered a process called malting. 
Malting is a very interesting process and technically a rather sophisticated process. In the process of malting, the grain is allowed to germinate. It germinates until about the first or second leaf stage. If you've ever watched a grain seed germinate, it throws out three or four little roots, and it will put out a little leaf and then a second leaf. During this process of germination, the seed gets soft, and it produces a lot of enzymes, organic catalysts, which convert starch to sugar. And it's this sugar that the leaf is being formed from and the roots are being formed from. It's a method of the plant has of mobilizing the starch into something that the plant can germinate and grow on, and that, that is sugar. Well, if at this particular stage you take this seed, it's only got one leaf, most of the starch is now into the form of sugar, or a good part of it is, and you dry it, out in the sun, so there's no moisture, and if you dry it at that stage, it will stop germinating, and you will preserve all these enzymes here. You will also preserve all of the sugar. And that, if you then grind that up, you have a sweet uh, <coughs> mixture of sugar and enzymes and a little residual starch. That's what you put in your malted milk, when you have a malted milk. Uh, that is what they began to use then for making beer. Instead of making beer out of the grain itself, which doesn't ferment very rapidly because it's starch, and this is very difficult to ferment, they used malt. The malt had all of these enzymes in here, and they would convert all the starch that was in the seeds themselves, but the enzymes would also convert a lot more starch. So finally, you were using 90% of dried up grain and 10% of malt. There was enough enzymes in just 10% of malt to convert all of that starch over to sugar. And the sugar will ferment very actively. So by this process, they were able to make beer very rapidly. And the process came into use about 3000 BC. Beer was by far the most popular beverage at the time. Uh, it was not a very permanent beverage and did not have a very high alcohol content, but it was a beverage that was easy to produce and could be produced the year round. So that uh, the people found that it was a source of relaxation, the alcohol content in it. It had a large number of B vitamins from the yeast. It had the calories of its own calories from the beer itself, and it had the calories from the yeast that were still present. It was a, still a cloudy beverage, but they had gotten rid of all that solid material, or most of that solid material. So it looked something like modern beer. It had, they didn't have, know how to filter it. They didn't know how to clarify it. Uh, it was sometimes gassier than other times. In fact, it was just like the home beer that your father made last summer uh, in his home. Uh, sometimes it would clog up when you opened the bottle. Sometimes the yeast would stay at the bottom. At some later time, perhaps a thousand years later, somebody began to domesticate the grape. They brought it out of the south slopes of the Caucasus Mountains down into the fertile plain below, and it spread very rapidly from there to the Middle East, to Israel, and further south to, to Egypt. And the fact that we know the grape as a sort of Mediterranean plant simply means that it moved with civilization from the Tigris-Euphrates, Iran-Iraq area, to the Mediterranean and spread very rapidly all around the Mediterranean. All of the peoples of the Mediterranean, from one end of the Mediterranean to the other, became uh, uh, drinkers of wine in preference to beer before the Christian era, and remained drinkers of wine clear up until the Muslim period, starting in 600 AD.
when North Africa gradually abandoned the drinking of wine, uh, and uh, although they still make wine in North Africa, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later, they, the consumption of wine in North Africa because of religious beliefs is very small, per capita wise, uh, negligible. Well, the early winemaking was, again, more or less by chance. Somebody crushed some grapes, left them open, and they soon discovered they fermented and produced a rather pleasant uh, beverage. They drank it rather quickly because they had no knowledge of acetification, and the wine quickly turned to vinegar. And so when people tell me, oh, if we could just make wine the natural way, not have any of man's dirty fingers in it and so forth, what a wonderful thing it would be. Well, if God really had his way, he'd make vinegar, not wine. That's the net end product of the whole process. If you want to drink vinegar, it's perfectly all right with me. But you're much better off making man-made, drinking a man-made product like wine than you are drinking a uh, God-made product like vinegar. In fact, vinegar in high concentrations will be toxic, so that it's, not, it's only used as a condiment. We use vinegar to put a little bit of it on food and so forth, but not to drink by itself. Well, they learned how to crush it, primarily with their feet. They even learned how to press the last juice out with bags, put it in some cloth, and squeeze the cloth. Or eventually they had primitive presses uh, where they put the skins all together and wrap cloth around it and put some weights on it. As soon as they learned the lever and the principle of the lever, where they began to apply a lever to the, to the um, pressing operation. As a matter of fact, the whole concept of the screw and the press and so forth owes a good deal to the practical demands of the wine industry uh, rather than to any other reason. They uh, even learned something about industrial hazards. The other byproduct of alcoholic fermentation, besides alcohol, the main one, is carbon dioxide. There's some very good Egyptian hieroglyphics, about 1500 BC, showing people crawling out of the fermenting room overcome with carbon dioxide. Very good illustration of an industrial hazard developing in an early period. From the hieroglyphics, we know in the period 2500 to 1500 BC that they had discovered the regional effects on wine quality, namely the wines of the Delta were much better than those up at the first cascade of the, of the Nile River. They may or may not have discovered the difference between red wine and white wine. That seems to be a little bit in doubt quite recently because the words for red and white also have a meaning of the lower Nile and the upper Nile. So we're not quite certain whether they're talking about wines from the lower Nile or the upper Nile or whether they're talking about red and white wines in some cases. But they probably had learned at least uh, the effect of red and white wines because the hieroglyphics show them pressing and the pressing undoubtedly was to make a uh, white wine. They had also learned something of its medicinal use to keep oxygen away from wounds. Uh, it was a quick restorative. They had learned something about uh, spoilage of wine because vinegar was a commercial product in Egypt this time. They knew something about the storage temperature at Jericho, uh, over on the Jordan River, east of Jerusalem. You can see still a very big excavation. It's now some 100 feet below the surface of the ground, where the early uh, settlers of that region had dug holes in this basement down into the rock and lined the sides of the rock and put their wine down in these storage containers very far underneath the ground and a complete story above that was the, was the street level. This was to keep them cool, undoubtedly, and I'll have something more to say about spoilage of Israeli wines in a few minutes. At least in Iraq and Iran, they had learned two other things about wines that are not so interesting, and they also learn them about beer. One is that you could sophisticate wines, that is, you could falsify wines, and you can do this for beer too, 
and milk, as far as that's concerned, by adding water. And so there were rules laid down as early as 15, 1600 BC, providing penalties for the dilution of beer or for the dilution of wine. The addition of water was, a, could, was very difficult to detect, but if you were caught in the act, which is even, I suppose, better proof of the thing than any chemical proof, uh, you could be fined or even imprisoned. Uh, they had also learned how to tax wines, unfortunately. Alcoholic beverages have, therefore, from the very beginning, been considered by the establishment or by the, the state as a legitimate uh, source of income. It wasn't very much. It was more or less like a business tax for being in business and so forth. It was not until the Middle Ages that wine really got the full brunt of taxation, and the English gave us that. The English puritanical belief that there was something not quite right about wine and, and that you didn't have to have wine to live, which may or may not be true, and uh, that therefore the state could collect a tax on it because it, it was something that the people could do without, a luxury tax. That concept is not until the 17th century. But the idea that wines could be taxed goes very far back in the history of the wine industry. Well, why did they have wine in ancient civilizations? I've jumped down to number five, those of you who are following your outlines now. First of all, uh, they had wine because there was grapes available. This was the home of the grape, this area here. It was less contaminated than water, at 12% alcohol. Most of the gastrointestinal organisms which cause so much suffering from Mexico to wherever you want to go in the world uh, will, will not grow. So by drinking water, they avoided gastric upsets from uh, various kinds of bacteria. They uh, enjoyed the pleasant effects, the relaxing effect. Wine is in its way the earliest and perhaps the safest tranquilizer we have. It had a mild antiseptic value on wounds and things like that. And even if you had a gastric upset, it would probably help. There were a lot of vitamins from yeast. They hadn't learned how to separate the yeast from the wine. So the whole B-complex vitamin was there. This was probably fairly important in the wintertime when they were on restricted diets and vegetables were hard to get. They also got calories both from the yeast itself and from the alcohol, readily available energy, so that it was a quick pick-me-up. And particularly where the wines had, had stuck, where the wines had not fermented dry, and this must have happened fairly often, when they didn't know the relationship between sugar and alcohol, as you know, they must have picked raisins in some case, where the fermentation would simply stop because there was too much alcohol there, and there would still be residual sugar. So there's a lot of calories from sugar, too. And it wasn't very long, we don't know exactly when, when they learned how to, to boil down grape juice and then add the grape juice to the finished wine. Uh, so they got calories from sugar fairly often. In fact, the grape was one of the best sources of sugar, one of the easiest sources of sugar in a period when there wasn't very much sugar around. There was some aesthetic pleasure, but I don't think there was any aesthetic pleasure at first. The people may have looked prettier to each other, but the concept of the aesthetic value in the wine itself, which we'll be talking about in our last lecture, that's a rather modern concept. It's slightly present in the Roman period. Some of the poems of Horace, for example, seem to have some aesthetic idea about wine. But I don't think that wine as an object of aesthetic pleasure as such uh, can go back that far. And then, of course, there was the mystical nature of wine itself. Here was an innocuous beverage, grape juice, one day. And four days later, it was red. And if you drank it, you got tipsy and couldn't walk straight and couldn't, and couldn't talk straight and said things you shouldn't have said. Uh, th that gave them the idea that there must be something mysterious being added to the wine. They had no idea what there was any such thing as alcohol and so forth. So it became something to uh, precious. It, it, it had 
the hand of the God had been laid on it in a, in a certain way. Something mystical had entered into the grape juice by fermentation. And uh, this led to its ceremonial use. It's been offered as a gift to the gods at an early stage and later as a symbol of life itself. The red color, like blood, blood being associated with life. And here was a red wine, which had these mystical properties to change people's habits and change people's uh, performance uh, after drinking only a small amount of it. So that uh, this in itself gave it a certain um, prestige in so primitive societies and leads to it being used symbolically. The development of some of the best kinds of Greek art, for example, were Greek drinking vessels where the artist had obviously lavished all of his attention to make something beautiful to put the wine in because the wine was going to be drunk to the household gods or to uh, whatever uh, object they were going to drink to at that time. Why should grapes have been cultivated early? And why should we have had them in this area? Well, the climate was very good. It is the native home of the grape in that area, as I've already pointed out. But the main reason why the grape offered a lot of advantages to it, it's a high sugar uh, product, grapes themselves going to 20 to 30 percent sugar. The only other products they had that even was related to this would be the dates and the fig. And uh, they were only growing in semi-tropical areas, whereas the grape would grow in temperate areas. So the grape was a readily available source of sugar in areas where there was very little sugar. But most important, I think the grape survived, not just because it's something good to eat and uh, has a nice flavor, a very pleasant flavor, and so forth. It comes in a variety of forms, red and white, muscat and non-muscat, and so forth. But I think the fact that it can be converted into two other usable products is what made the grape important in that area. First of all, it could be converted to wine, and that made it an important uh, thing for cultivation. And the others, it could be converted into raisins. And raisins constituted a non-perishable food product with high sugar content. So raisins had the great value that they could be kept through the winter when other sources of, of high calorie foods were not very easily available. Well, winemaking may have been important. There was trade in wine at an early stage. We have perfectly good evidence of Greek amphora. A Greek amphora was a clay pot like this, held about three gallons. We have very good evidence of Greek amphora in the pre-Christian period being carried all the way up the Nile to near where Khartoum now is in the Sudan. That's a long way. The, obviously, the Greek and Roman settlers in, in that area, the traders in that area, demanded and got uh, wine from the home country. They also brought olive oil up in these same things, which is not a part of this course, but there's an indication that there was not olives and grapes in these very hot tropical areas. But the wine wasn't very good. It certainly wasn't very good in the Greek period, and it's not until the Roman period that we see the development of something like the modern wine industry. We have two quick and easy biblical stories that tell us how bad wine was in the first century, the beginning of the Christian period. One of them is the Feast of Cana in the New Testament. And it's an easy story to understand. It's a story. It's not a parable. It's a story, although it may have some overtones of a parable. The story is that, uh, that Jesus and his mother went to a wedding feast. And the wedding feast was going great style. And uh, they ran out of wine very quickly. And Mary turns to her son and says, do something about this, miracle worker. And so he did. He went out in the next room, and uh, he had him pour water in the, in the amphora. And when they brought it back, everybody was amazed because they said, what a rich man's home we are in. What a rich man's home we are in. I'm paraphrasing the Bible, but this is exactly what it says. Because 
He's so rich that the second wine we're getting here today is better than the first wine. The obvious implication of that was that in the normal course of events, unless you were very, very rich in Israel in the first century, if you had any money, you spent a little bit of it on buying a little bit of good wine, and you got everybody a little tipsy, and then you gave them the vinegar wine for the second wine. But in this case, the man was so rich that the second wine was even better than the first wine. Now, the people didn't know that a miracle had been performed, and I don't know that a miracle was performed. I'm not trying to convince anybody that a miracle was performed. However, he did the trick. It certainly was obvious from the people's reaction to it that the second wine was better than the first, and that meant that they were a very lucky people indeed. I would hate to have thought about what the household looked like if the second wine was really wine and was better than the first wine. There are some theologians that say the second wine wasn't wine at all. They'd just gotten too tipsy on the first wine and that all they were getting was some colored water in the second case. It's quite true that if you put red wine in a container, it will throw a precipitate of colored material, and then if you put water in it, you will get some water. If they also put a little acetic acid in it at the same time, the water would turn red instead of blue, and it may have looked like wine. For whatever reason, the story is interesting to us in illustrating that very few people could have very good wine throughout the meal. Only very rich people could have good wine throughout the meal. The other one is a true parable. A parable is where a story is told. In any of the Arabic countries, this is true. And they still, use, they still tell parables in Arabic countries. But what the parable says is not what they mean at all. The parable is simply a means of telling a sermon in, in a language that everybody would understand. Now, that's what makes this story so significant, because everybody, they were just farmers and fishermen and so forth, who were tax collectors and so forth, his disciples, who were listening to this parable. And they all understood the parable immediately. So it means that it must have reflected some common knowledge of everybody. The parable is, uh, in just two phrases, says, don't put new wine in new bottles lest it break the bottles, it ferment and break the bottles, and you'll lose the wine. But rather, put new wine, I said that story wrong. <laughs> Let me write it down. So I hope that's, okay. that's the first time in 25 years that I've told that story wrong, too. <laughs> so I'm doubly embarrassed about it. Don't put new wine in old bottles, lest it spill and so forth, but put new wine in new bottles. Now, that's the way the either the Catholic version or the Protestant version or the New American version reads, but that isn't the way it was written, because they didn't have bottles. That's what was written when the King James Version was translation was made uh, in the early 17th century. But what they actually had at that time to put wine in in Israel was goat skins. <coughs> Don't put new wine in old goat skins lest it ferment and break the goat skins and the contents will be lost. But rather put new wine in new goat skins, where if it ferments, it will stretch, and the, con the, the container will not break, and the contents will not be lost. Now, that's as far as we're concerned, that's all you need to know about the story. It simply shows that new wine in Israel at that time was not very stable, that new wine was spoiling. They hadn't learned how to finish the fermentation, the, there was very great probability that the fermentations that were going on were not yeast fermentations. They were probably bacterial fermentations of various kinds, producing carbon dioxide. Whether it was yeast fermentation or whether it was bacterial fermentation doesn't make any difference. They obviously had not learned how to finish the fermentations. So if they put new wine in an, in an old stiff goat skin that it would, had gotten very stiff and any carbon dioxide was formed, the goat skin couldn't stretch at all and the cotton would break the goat skin open and uh, the contents would be lost. 
But if you put it in a new goat skin, and the carbon dioxide was formed in it, the goat skin would simply stretch. As a matter of fact, I've seen in my lifetime in Spain, uh, goat skins down in La Mancha, uh, they were actually cow skins with the apertures all sewed up, which had fermented and the goat skin had stretched. Uh, uh, appreciable amount, say 25% stretching. So the story is perfectly true. Well, I suppose now I better tell you what the parable means, otherwise I haven't really I've told you all I need to tell you about the quality of wine in Israel at that time. Apparently, and these people all understood this now quite intuitively, and they understood what he meant to say. Most modern theologians say that what he was saying to his disciples, this was a very late parable in Jesus' career, uh, that what he was really trying to tell them was, don't put his new philosophy, his new theories about religion and so forth, into the traditional forms of Judaism, lest it break the traditional forms of Judaism, which were quite fixed and rigid at that time, and the whole religious concept of monotheism would break down, but rather put his new ideas into new forms. Now, some doubters in that thing simply say that this parable was coined by Paul, who was the real originator of the ancient church, rather than by Jesus, and that this parable really didn't come out of uh, Jesus' mouth. I don't, I'm not a scholar and I don't know which is true or not, but the parable is a perfectly good parable and shows that they must have been getting lots of secondary fermentations in the first century A.D. Whoever said it, whether Paul said it or whether Jesus said it, it's not an important thing as far as this class is concerned. Well, the Greeks came along and the Greeks were, had a real hard time of it. First of all, <coughs> Greece has very poor land. It had poor land in Homer's time, 7800 BC, it had poor land at its great glorious period of Pericles, 400 BC, and it still has poor land today. And the main two crops that they can easily grow on poor soil of this kind are grapes and olive oil, and grapes and olive trees. So the Greek uh, penchant or the Greek uh, genius for traveling was not because the Greek people liked to travel, but they had to find grain someplace in order to survive. So they established colonies at a very early date on the mainland, hence Troy, at an even earlier date perhaps in Sicily, hence Syracuse, at a very early date up and down the coast of, of Spain from Cadiz on the south all the way up to next to Barcelona on the north. Uh, they even settled at Marseille in the south of France. And the the trading arrangements they made in order to support the motherland and also the, make the colonists happy was that they shipped olive oil and wine to the colonies and the colonies shipped grain back so they could have, gra so they could have grain in Sparta or in Athens, primarily Athens. It was a very good arrangement for Sparta and Athens or for the Greek mainland and it was also a good arrangement for the colonies because it gave them something from the homeland and they could then barter their grain to the mainland. Well, with this, then they learned quite a bit more about grapes. The large-scale trade they were doing with Egypt at the same time, probably with the mainland as well, uh, led them to discover the difference between varieties of grapes. We have no reason to believe that the Egyptians or the early Israelis knew the difference between one variety and the next, but the Greeks certainly did. They also knew something about pruning. Now, pruning is a very useful operation because if you don't uh, prune grapevines, they literally fruit themselves to death. And so the pruning hook, which is nothing more or less than a little piece of metal in the form of a hook, which was used to cut the stems, is a Greek invention. They had learned something about fertilizing the vineyards and something about uh, a little bit more about winemaking. They had learned, for example, to seal these amphora with plaster of Paris up here at the top. And in some cases, they put the name of the winemaker and the place it came from. So we have here an example of regional labeling at a very early date and the winemaker being given credit for the product that he makes. So the Greeks must have had some concept of quality in wine. And in fact, they did because they took those sponges and would dip them in the wine and then put the sponge out and take most of the wine out of it and draw air into the sponge and then put it under their nose 
and squeeze the sponge. This was a method of getting a lot of volatility out of the wine very quickly. They didn't have nice big glasses to swirl it in like you do and so forth. And uh, so we have here an early example of quality control in an industry. Quality control first from the winemaker's point of view and quality control from the wine buyer's point of view, namely that he could test the wine and the wine merchant could test the wine and so forth. They had also learned something else and that was flavoring of wine. This is another indication of how bad wines must have been at this period. Uh, the idea of adding something to the wine is not completely Greek, however. It goes clear back to Egyptian times. The addition of some dates and things like that to the wine to flavor it uh, had carried over to the wine industry. But the Greeks brought it to a very high pitch. Even at the time of Homer, uh, flavored wines was very, uh, very well known. A uh, good example of that is in the Odyssey. Uh, in Homer's Odyssey, after he goes through this long, long voyage and he comes home, he's very tired. He's had remarkable experiences for a young man. He's been gone for a number of years. And in his honor, having arrived back at the family home, a wine cup is made for him. And that's why the Greek wine cups were rather large. They held a quart. Uh, you can see some in the museum in Athens, some very good ones. Some of them in gold. The, the very best ones are in gold. The gold ones are somewhat smaller than the silver ones, I must say. Uh, they put some wine in here, some water, because the wine was rather strong, and then they added herbs and perfumes. Frankincense and myrrh is mentioned, and a great many other herbs are mentioned as being put into the wine as the mother prepares the cup for the traveler who's returned from the Odyssey to drink. Uh, it had a ceremonial function, but why did they add the flavor? Well, I've given you several reasons for it here in, in um, uh, number three. First of all, it added a flavor of its own. And let's give them credit for that. I think that's probably true. The wine, however, must have not had very good flavors, so it was also be added, being added to cover up the bad flavor of the wine. Now, which one of those is most important, I don't know but both of them took place. They had the idea that in some cases, the addition of the herbs would prevent spoilage. So they actually added it to the wine in the amphora, right in the amphora, the herbs are put. And that is still the modern practice in Greece. One third of all the wines made in Greece today have rosin added to them. And the product is called retsina. So if you go to Greece this summer, or next summer, or as soon as you can, and I hope you do go to Greece sometime, uh, try Retsina. But uh, you can make Retsina at home just as well as not. One teaspoonful of turpentine added to a bottle of wine will make a very good imitation Retsina. Because rosin, the rosin they're using contains turpentine. They grind up dried rosin, from which you could produce turpentine if you distilled it, and uh, put it in the wine and the oil of turpentine is absorbed into the wine, and it gives a very nice turpentine flavor. If you drink this every day for 50 years, you'll become addicted to it. Uh, and one third of the Greeks are addicted to it, because one third of all the Greek wines are consciously converted to Retsina. In fact, we have a winery right down here near Lodi that produces Retsina, and there's a very large uh, distribution of Retsina in uh, Chicago, where I understand we have the largest collection of Greeks in the country. In fact, some Greek families don't consider it Christmas unless they have a bottle of Retsina on the table. Uh, it would make me ill, but that's their method of doing it, and there's, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, this idea that it prevented spoilage is not true. Retsina will spoil, turn to vinegar just as fast as uh, ordinary wine without the rosin added to it. It was supposed to to make you fall in love quicker and perform quicker. Uh, to have aphrodisiacal properties. Now that's not true. And I would, if you don't learn anything else from this lecture, you better learn that. It's all explained very carefully in the prologue for the third act of Macbeth. Shakespeare has said it better there and quicker there 
than any place else. You remember it's the knock, knock, knock scene. The uh, Macbeth has gotten the gatekeeper drunk, so he wouldn't hear what was going on inside. And the people that come back and they knock, 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 and there's a lot of symbolism in that and so forth. And uh, the gatekeeper admits that he drank too much. And uh, then he philosophizes on it. And uh, the philosophy is, and it's still true today, as it was in Shakespeare's time, and it's the nature of alcohol. It creates the desire, but it takes away the performance. And uh, that's so that the, the more resin, retsina you drink, uh, you're not going to find it to be very helpful, I can tell you that, even if you can drink it. Uh, there were other things that they probably added the thing to also. They, there may have been some idea that, that there was an added quality factor in these for, besides its flavor, that it had some sort of additional value, the addition of these. Not quite clear whether that's true or not, but the other things are true. For its own flavor, to cover up another flavor, to try and prevent spoilage, which probably wasn't true, and for its properties of making you love people better, those seem to be quite true. The Romans added just a few things. They learned a lot more about grape varieties. They learned a lot more about keeping wines. And they developed the wooden cooperage, which is a very great engineering achievement. Uh, wooden cooperage is an unstable engineering thing. It depends upon the use of a hoop, originally of wood, but later of metal, to keep the staves, the wooden pieces that are built around it, under a certain tension to hold it together. If you remove the hoops, the whole thing falls apart. Uh, so from the engineering point of view, this was a pretty good size achievement. But from the wine point of view, it was wonderful. These amphora leaked. They had to be coated with pitch. So most of the wines before the Roman period tasted like petroleum, unfortunately, <laughs> or at least like asphalt. Now, they didn't know any different, so that, that there was, there, everything is relative in, the, in this field. Nobody had ever tasted one without that, or very few of them had tasted without that. But it was the Romans who built wooden cooperage, which by themselves could be kept, uh, uh, could keep the wine in it. They were easy to keep full. These were somewhat difficult. If you put plaster of Paris around here, you had to break it apart and then put new plaster of Paris on it, and so forth. So that uh, this achievement of the Romans was pretty good. They had learned primitive filtration, and they had also learned some uh, ideas about pasteurization. At least they had smoked wines. And they didn't like the smoked wines. They put them in a smokehouse where they were smoking meat. So it probably had some smell of the meat as well as the uh, smoke itself, wood smoke, and so forth. They had some very good ideas about distributing wine. The slaves got so much. Superintendent got so much, and the owner got so much, and so much was sold. Uh, they had a, they, uh, at least in some of the texts of the period, uh, the Roman agricultural writers told you how many slaves you needed, and how many horses you needed, and how many cows you needed, and what to do with the manure of each one of them, of each one of them, vis-a-vis -vis the fertilization of the vineyard how much wine you should give to each person per day to keep him happy throughout the year, and all sorts of interesting details of that kind. So that uh, wine was really uh, a rather common thing in the Roman period. Then came the Middle Ages, sometimes called the Dark Ages. And there was this, the Mediterranean countries, particularly Cyprus and those areas of southern Spain, never really lost a good deal of their winemaking uh, aspect. But Northern Europe and, and, and Central Europe probably did. The continued invasions from the east across the north of Europe made it very difficult to keep an agricultural project going. And particularly one as difficult to keep going. It has to be pruned at the right time. The grapes must be picked at the right time and so forth. And then storing large quantities, quantities of, of, of beverage with marauding armies running over you all the time and knowing that taste of armies for alcoholic beverages, 
you wouldn't have any alcoholic beverages after they went through, and you probably wouldn't even be there to take care of the vineyard the next year. So the monastic system became an important aspect of the preservation of the grape and wine industry. As you'll recall, it was established in the ninth century. It was going pretty well in the ninth century and lasted for about five or 600 years in its greatest force. During this time, they were the only stable organization uh, in Northern Europe or in Central Europe. Uh, they were protected by the church. Their property was protected by the church and uh, they were not always respected by the marauding armies, but most of the time they could retreat into the monastery and protect themselves. In some cases they put a large fence around their vineyard. There's a very good example of that in uh, just south of Dijon at a famous vineyard called Clos Bougeau. This is a red Burgundian wine and uh, 150 acres. The monastic system there built a clay fence all around the 120 acres, I guess it is. And the, the monastery is in the middle and it's completely surrounded by the vineyard. You see lots of pictures of Clos Rougeau because it's so picturesque. That was to protect the vineyard from marauding neighbors as well as from marauding armies and so forth. The, uh, they also looked around to find good places to put monasteries. Uh, particularly one monastic group called the Cistercians. This was an English order, but mostly was established on the continent. They were an outbreak of the Cluny, which was the great monastic organization. And they devoted themselves pretty largely to planting vineyards and planting, making wine. There's a very good example of a Cistercian monastery just outside of Tarragona in Spain at Poblet. Beautiful example of the Cistercians at work. Uh, there they even took rock and carved uh, a furrow in the rock so that the wine could run from one barrel down to the filter in another one uh, since they had no hoses and so forth. This is a 13th century uh, monastery in a fair state of repair. I've also seen a Cistercian monastery about 150 miles north of Beograd in Yugoslavia. So they were widely distributed over Europe, and they specialized on the making of wine. Along the Rhine, almost all of the important vineyard areas where grapes did the best was discovered by monasteries. The most famous vineyard on the Rhine, for example, Schloss Johannesburger, was a monastery up until the Napoleonic Wars, uh, when it was confiscated and all the monasteries were confiscated. They made wine for themselves, of course. They made wine for selling to other people. And most important, they justified this whole thing on the fact that they were making wine for the sacrifice of the mass, and that therefore the, the fact that they drank it themselves and that they also were selling it for money uh, was secondary to the fact that they were doing a good work in God's eyes uh, if they had wine for the sacrifice of the mass. After the Council of Trent, which was in the 14th century, uh, red wines and grape wines became necessary for the sacrifice of the mass. Before that, other beverages had been used for the sacrifice of the mass. But after that date, only red wine and white bread could be used for the sacrifice of the mass. So the church had a very big impact on the wine industry. First of all, it protected knowledge of winemaking. It protected vineyards. It discovered new vineyard areas. It learned something about the quality of the wines because they had to test one vineyard as against another vineyard and so forth. They even sold them at different prices and so forth. And uh, most important of all, I think, they kept some idea of the, of the aesthetic value of wine going. Uh, they had the time and the leisure. Uh, they could read, not when, a time when many people could not read. So they created the whole concept of the modern wine industry. Now, that does not mean that private people didn't contribute. Uh, sometimes I think the text is a little overemphasized on this point. The text does not give full credit to private enterprise, particularly in northern Germany. Private enterprise probably had more to do with it than, than, um, than the monasteries, and that's also true of Bordeaux. But we'll start with France next time.